like you just had two hours of sleep. Yes. No, 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 I slept. I, I had plenty of sleep. I slept oh. two hours. Oh, I had two hours. Yeah. And it's Friday, so I feel like And welcome to the third program in the 2016 Robbins Memorial Symposium. My name is Michael Golay. I'm a history instructor at the Academy and a member of the faculty and student planning committee for our four event Robbins series titled War on the Innocents, the Syrian Humanitarian Crisis. In five years, the Syrian civil war has claimed nearly a half million lives. Syria's wealth has been all but wiped out. The international community has been powerless to arrest this avalanche of disaster. The Americans have focused on military and economic containment of the Islamic State. The Iranians, and now the Russians, have given priority to propping up the murderous dictatorship of Bashar al-Assad. The Turks oppose Assad, but also the Syrian Kurds who are fighting him. Too often, it's impossible to tell the good from the bad, ally from enemy. Syria is a humanitarian catastrophe. Innocents are dying every day. People trapped in Aleppo and other besieged towns go without food, water, basic services, medical care. There is near starvation in some cities. The war has touched off one of the great refugee mass movements of the last half century. Some two and a half million refugees have crossed into Turkey. Many, many thousands more are moving toward Europe, touching off a political crisis in the states of the European Union. The Russians, the Americans, and other parties evidently have agreed to a partial ceasefire, supposed to take effect on Saturday. I expect the panelists will try to gauge how successful this might be. In any case, people in opposition-held areas say they don't trust the Assad government and its Russian and Iranian allies to suspend military operations that in recent weeks have displaced tens of thousands of people and involved the bombing of hospitals, sc schools, and markets. Some human rights groups say hospitals have been deliberately targeted. The first two programs in the Robin series introduced us to the tragedy of the Syrian civil war. Just outside the doors of this hall, on either side, you'll see an exhibit of drawings by Syrian children in refugee camps in Turkey, assembled by an Exonian who worked in the camps three summers ago. The drawings should give you an emotional connection to the terrible ordeal of Syrian innocence. Do have a look on your way out. Tonight's program will explore the origins, consequences, and potential outcomes of the Syrian Civil War. The Robbins Memorial Symposium concludes tomorrow morning with an assembly address by the Harvard scholar Tarek Massoud of the Kennedy School of Government and Exeter class of 1993. Dr. Massoud will moderate tonight's panel, and he will introduce the panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? I'm sort of uh, constitutionally incapable of speaking while seated, but I think I'm going to have to try. So uh, I'm Tarek Massoud. I am a very proud graduate, as uh, Mr. Golay has mentioned, of this uh, fine institution, and I teach at uh, an earnest little institution up the road in uh, Boston. And as Mr. Golay has mentioned, uh, my central obsession and the central obsession of those of us uh, sitting up here has been the unfolding catastrophe in the Middle East. We know that in 
March of 2011, Syrians took to the streets by the hundreds and then by the thousands, demanding legitimate, decent, accountable government. Not much to ask for in 2016. And instead, what they have gotten is what uh, was what the political philosopher Thomas Hobbes called the war of all against all. Life in Syria today is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Hundreds of thousands of people have died. Millions have been sent into internal and external exile. And as Mr. Golay aptly mentioned, this is putting an enormous amount of pressure on Syria's neighbors and even on European countries that are ill-disposed to receive those who are knocking at their door. It's not an exaggeration to say that the crisis in Syria is probably the most pressing political crisis of the last 50 years in the Middle East, maybe the last 100 years of the Middle East, and it's going to be with us for a very long time. And so, because you people are basically the equivalent of the 1% when it comes to education, you're at the finest educational institution in the world, you get to have the finest panel in the world to discuss this issue and help you make sense of it. And I'm going to introduce our participants in no particular order. I'm going to start with Ambassador Robert Ford, who was U.S. Ambassador in Syria from 2011 to 2014. So this is somebody who knows something about the country that we are discussing today. Before he was in Syria, he was in another country that uh, another pleasant and peaceful and uneventful country, Iraq, where he was the deputy U.S. ambassador from 2008 to 2010. And before that, he was our country's ambassador in Algeria. He's served in several other hotspots in the region, including Bahrain, another country about which we could have a uh, conversation. And he has been recognized by the State Department for his long and meritorious service. He's also been recognized uh, more broadly, in 2012, he received an award from the John F. Kennedy Library, the Profile and Courage Award, for his role in uh, defending human rights around the world, and particularly in Syria. He's now a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C., and he is a proud graduate of Johns Hopkins, where he earned a bachelor's in international studies and a master's in Middle East studies. Uh, to my right is Mr. Herdick, Mr. Andrew Herdick, who is known to everyone here, recently retired from the History Department, where he served as chair and was also dean of the faculty. I, when I was here, I did not have the pleasure of being in Mr. Herdick's class, but I always knew who he was, and like many of my fellow students, was always uh, in awe of him. And in fact, one of the most surreal experiences of my life was giving a talk, and then afterwards, Mr. Herdick coming up to introduce himself to me, and I just said, you don't, I know exactly who you are. Uh, you know. um, um, Mr. Herdick um, is a graduate of Harvard College and uh, has an MA in history from Berkeley, and for over a decade has taught a course here and at Exeter on the history of the modern Middle East, a course that I wish had been offered when I was a student. Uh, here. He's thought very deeply and carefully about the Syria issue. How do I know this? Because I basically agree with everything he thinks. Okay. Um, finally, we're honored to be joined by Alina Sergi Atta, who is a Syrian American architect and writer who is also the co founder and CEO of the Karam Foundation, an organization that works on behalf of Syrian refugees and has pioneered many creative techniques for lifting up Syrian children and creating opportunity for Syrian youth. She frequently goes to the Syrian border where, with, uh, with Turkey where she coordinates uh, some of her program's activities. So she is deeply, deeply familiar with uh, the situation on the ground. She graduated from the University of Aleppo in architecture before continuing her graduate studies at the Rhode Island School of Design at MIT. She's written very widely about this issue in the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, has appeared all over uh, television and other media outlets. There is nobody who can give us a better picture of what is happening in Syria and uh, what uh, potential hope there is in that country. So what I'd like to do is structure, we have up until about 8.30. I'd like us to leave some time for questions at the end, about 15 minutes. So what I'd like to do is structure this as an informal conversation among the three of you, um, with maybe some outbursts from me, but I'll try to uh, moderate myself as well. With, with Lena. Um, Lena, you and your foundation 
have been doing extraordinary work in Syria among refugees. You know intimately the situation there. You had family there. Uh, can you set the scene for us? Can you describe what is happening in Syria now and where you see it going? Um, thank you very much. First, I'd like to thank um, Philip Sensitor Academy for having me here tonight and having this panel and actually having this whole week dedicated to Syria. And I thank all of you for coming out today to hear more about what's going on in Syria because um, it is the largest humanitarian crisis of our lifetime. It is one of the biggest disasters that has happened in uh, modern history. And Syrians do feel um, almost five years in, and one month will be five years into this war and this crisis, we still feel very much that the Syrian people are alone. And we feel very much isolated and still feel that our voices have not been heard by the world. Um, I am from originally from Aleppo, the largest city inside Syria, and my family had to flee. My parents were both doctors, um, were all American citizens. They did their residencies here in the United States. Um, we moved back to Syria in 1986. I continued my studies here, and I've been in America for a long time, but they had to flee in 2012 with nothing but four suitcases and have lost everything that they've owned. Um, the only reason why we are not refugees and they are not refugees is because we are American citizens. There's nothing different between me and my family and the people that you see going on the boats to Europe. We could have, told, we could have been them very, very easily. Um, to be Syrian now means that you have experienced loss. Every single Syrian family has experienced loss in some way. If you are Syrian, it means someone you know has died, someone you know has been tortured, someone you know is a refugee. And most Syrians have lost home and what home means, even if they're still inside Syria. Um, so it's a very devastating thing to be part of. And what the only thing that gives me hope and resilience is by doing the work with my organization, Karam Foundation, and we have a great team of people very much dedicated to focus on the future, to focus on Syrian refugee teens and kids, and we do our work um, as a team twice a year on southern Turkey to give innovative education workshops to Syrian refugee teens and youth, and it's kind of like we have to keep that balance between being Syrian and seeing the big picture and seeing a lot of despair and not a lot of hope moving forward and at the same time putting our blinders on and focusing on the people that we can impact and the people whose lives we can change which are the Syrian people, families and children that you can actually give them the tools and the skills um, to create and to, and to become something and not to define themselves by their loss and define themselves by hope and by what they can actually accomplish and we're actually seeing results in that and we'll probably talk about that in a little bit. Thank you. You know, Lena has described a situation in Syria that's pretty grim and people like Lena are doing the best that they can to alleviate the tremendous human suffering in that country. But I want to take you Ambassador Ford back to 2012. And you um, were awarded the JFK Profile and Courage Award for your work in Syria. And I read the award citation, and it's really a, a, a great testament to some of the work that Ambassador Ford was doing. So let me read you the citation, then ask you the question about it. So it says, on the ground in Syria, Ambassador Ford's robust diplomacy centered on a strong show of support for the Syrian opposition movement. At great personal risk, he traveled all over the country talking with the Syrian people and using social media to encourage dissidents to embrace forms of nonviolent protest against government-backed brutality. So clearly, when you were traveling around Syria in those early days of 2012, you didn't think, you didn't have in mind the terrible situation that Lena has just described. What did you think was going to happen? Thank you, Dar. Uh, first, let me also thank the Academy for inviting my wife to be here. It's a, really a delight to be here, and I had a session. We had a session with uh, some of the students before. Boy, uh, what an impressive young group. 
So, uh, going back to 2011, uh, the context was that Syrians had been riveted to their televisions every day and night watching the huge demonstrations in Cairo. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the pictures of those demonstrations, but there were literally millions of people in the uh, gigantic downtown square of Cairo called Liberation Square, Tahrir. Uh, and they had seen the Egyptian president, who had been president of Egypt for more than 30 years, uh, have to leave because of large, large street protests. Not much violence. And before that, in Egypt, uh, people had watched on their television every night the protests in Tunisia. And the Tunisian president also had had to leave just because there were these large, gigantic demonstrations. And the Syrian protesters, in starting in March, there was one protest in February, but starting in March, at the start, they weren't even trying to get rid of the current government. They just wanted reforms. They wanted to change. Uh, the first protests were actually in response to a specific incident of police brutality in a city to the south called Dara. And the uh, people who were marching wanted the security chief fired. Um, unfortunately, that security chief, um, whose policeman had tortured some children, uh, he was a cousin of the president, President Assad, and he had no intention of removing him. And so the protests continued. We want him out. We want him out. Um, and the police started shooting at the protesters. Um, the protesters also committed some acts of violence. Nobody was killed by um, five protesters. But they did burn down a court building. And they burned down a building belonging to the telephone company. Why? Because the president's cousin was very corrupt and was the telephone company. So uh, they were already sending a message that we want better government, we want an end to corruption, we want accountability, uh, no more torture. As I was talking to them, and of course it wasn't my business to support their demands or not, but it was my business to say if you stay peaceful, we support your right to express yourselves peacefully. That's a basic human right. I warned them that if they became violent, uh, they would, A, trigger more violence from the government, uh, which was already steadily rising, and B, they would lose international support. The reason so many people in the United States, in Europe, and other Middle Eastern countries in Asia were so supportive of Egypt was that the protests in Egypt were so peaceful. Huge, millions of people were peaceful. And I think most of the Syrians, the vast majority of the Syrians understood that, that it was peaceful and that it was more civilized. Um, as it wore on from March into June, July, August Tarek, and the casualty tolls from the government shooting at every protest, um, as those death toll numbers rose, some of the protesters started to shoot back. Um, and in many cases, they were soldiers who had defected from the Syrian army and did not want to shoot at the protesters, and so they changed sides on the spur of the moment. Um, and the violence started to really take off, and I remember having a, a meeting with a woman, very brave woman, you've probably heard of her, Razan Zaytunin. And I said to Razan, you know, this is getting violent, it's going to get worse and worse and worse, and you're going to lose international support. And she said, do you expect us to just get killed and act like Mahmoud Gandhi all the time? And she said, this is a government that's far more brutal than anything the British inflicted on India. She said, you can't, you cannot expect that at some point the protest movement isn't going to fight back. Um, and so by the end of 2011, it was clear that the country was spiraling down. The fact that it had spiraled down should not cause us to forget what started it. And what started it was a government that was brutal towards its own people, and a government that refused any level of accountability, and does to this day. Um, it, I don't <coughs> condone any violence on either side, but I think if we don't deal with the root problem, we can't actually end the violence. So like, from what I'm hearing from Ambassador Ford is that he really had a great deal of hope, as I did at that time, that a uh, Tunisian-style outcome was possible 
in Syria. And remember, in Tunisia, the dictator was overthrown more or less peacefully. Right? He took a flight to Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. There's no bloodshed. There's no... Knowing what we know about Syria, you've taught Middle Eastern history here. Was that ever really a realistic expectation in the Syrian case? Well, I, first of all, I don't know what the answer to that question is. I was, I was hoping, actually, that uh, Ambassador Ford might answer some of these questions. But, um, yeah, I, I think that it, it was certainly, it might have been possible if it hadn't been outside uh, factors that came in. Um, the Russians and the Iranians were providing support. <coughs> And then there was the influx of Islamic extremists uh, from, from Iraq, which became, uh, was the Islamic State. And that changed the nature of the um, conflict so that um, outside powers then began to look differently at it. Uh, and I think probably that's perhaps what's the dynamic now, that the United States, which started saying that Assad must go, and I guess tonight he said it again, but it's not clear exactly how um, Assad will go, and uh, the conflict has continued on. And so I think that the, the government is probably, the American government is probably thinking that the only way we're going to get uh, rid of Assad is with the Russians' help. Um, we don't have as much leverage um, there as you would, you would hope. And I guess I would, I would ask Ambassador Ford, that the moral question is really very clear, that this person is in fact brutal and has done, uh, been responsible for the death probably of a quarter of a million of his citizens. But the reality is that he has, he's actually winning right now with Russian support. So um, I guess I would ask the question of you, well, how are you going to get rid of the, uh, this um, morally reprehensible yeah. person? First, a little history. Um, I didn't mention an answer to your question, Dr. but let me share something I'll share with the group. So I'm the American ambassador in Syria. This street protest movement is growing and growing and growing. We have tens of thousands of people marching in the suburbs of Damascus peacefully, but big, big crowds. And in cities like Hama and out in the east, Deir Azor, not too far from Iraq, um, and in some of the cities uh, like Banyas on the Mediterranean coast and down in Dada. I mean, it's all over the country, and it's spreading, and it's on television, Al Jazeera, a lot of media networks. People are watching it, and it's growing. <laughs> and so several times I went in and talked to not President Assad himself, uh, but to his immediate advisors, um, if you will, the sort of Syrian equivalent of their National Security Council staff. Um, as well as their Secretary of State, their Foreign Minister, who you will still see on television, big portly man named Wali Mubarak. And in all of these conversations, I say, you know, these people are peaceful. We hope it stays peaceful. We're worried that it's not going to be peaceful. We, the Americans, are not trying to overthrow you. We're not trying to overthrow anyone. We want stability, but this is highly unstable. And it could get violent. And you need to talk to them. You need to stop shooting, and you need to start talking. And I'm not making this up at both the foreign ministry and at the presidency. They said, oh, yes, yes, we absolutely need to. You're absolutely right, Mr. Ambassador. They even went as far as to say, could you help us, Mr. Ambassador? I said, I will. I'm not in control of the protests at all, but I'm happy to recommend that they talk to you. Um, every time we tried to set up meetings between sort of the, some of the well-known, well better-known figures in the opposition. Every single time we did it, and we tried several times, the Syrian secret police would go in and arrest people a day or two at a time. And literally sink each time we tried to sink the initiative. Now, my question, which I can't answer to this day, is were the people I was talking to speaking truthfully? And there were other icky people in the shadows with their own agenda, hardline agenda, that were literally forestalling any effort at a negotiation and a, a dialogue. Or were the people 
at the foreign ministry and the presidency just flat out lying to me. Um, Mimi says, well, of course they were lying. I have to tell you, my heart tells me they were lying. Because after a couple of times, it was kind of clear that something was not sincere. Uh, and I didn't see President Assad fire anybody. I, my last message to him was, as the, as the thing was spiraling out of control in June, uh, through an intermediary who went straight into Bashar al-Assad, uh, my message was, the Americans are not trying to overthrow you, but this is going out of control. Can't you get in front of it by firing the heads of your secret police services? Then at least people would know you were serious. And the message came back, I won't. And so, in answer to your question, I think in the end this was inevitable, given where Assad was. Uh, going forward, I don't think a government that has killed, I don't know, 150 to 200,000 people uh, is going to just say, okay, we're tired, we're leaving. So getting to a new government, I think, will be very hard. I would like to be hopeful that the work that Secretary of State John Kerry is doing, and I know Secretary Kerry quite well, um, he's a great guy, and he's very sincere, and he's very hardworking. Uh, I would like to think that the things he's doing uh, in terms of the ceasefire and starting a political negotiation, finally, um, are going to bear fruit. But I have to say, the hard reality is that it's probably not. Um, I asked the group of young people that I sat with this afternoon if they thought Bashar al-Assad was more inclined to negotiate last summer when he was weak versus now when with Russian help he's much stronger. And I think all of us in the room agreed there was a better chance of getting to a negotiated deal with compromises uh, last summer. So, the point of, did you could we predict that um, Syria could have a revolution like the Tunisian revolution, or like the Egyptian revolution, or like any other revolution that happened during the Arab Spring. And obviously the answer, um, if you ask anybody who's my parents' age or older, would, they would say no. Because Syria is different than any of those countries. And I don't, I just came back yesterday from Jordan, and people in Jordan are kind of sitting, you know, kind of nervously thinking, is this going to hit, when, when is it going to hit us too? Because we're living literally in the middle of all of these countries that are kind of falling apart. And the thing is, is that Jordan is not Syria either. No, no, no country was like Syria. And it, the oppression and the fear, and the level of fear was something that people were very, very silent about for 40, over 40 years. And I don't think even our neighbors, our, our Jordanian and maybe the Lebanese a little bit more, but our neighbors did not know how bad it was. Visitors did not know. And that's why when the people went out on the streets and we were watching this on YouTube and watching it on TV, no, every Syrian knew that just to walk out on the street and say the word freedom is almost like you're committing suicide. That's a level of fear, and we saw that. We, and, and people my parents' age, all of them said that this is not going to work out, and he is going to kill everybody. And he said, he said that their, their motto was, Assad, or we will scorch the country. The people didn't believe that. The people didn't believe he would go that far. He said, we can get rid of half of the population. It's not a problem. He said, at the beginning of the revolution, when there were only people walking the streets peacefully, and he said, there are 64,000 terrorists amongst us, amongst us, and I need to get rid of them. This is a country where you couldn't even go visit your relatives without having the secret police knowing exactly what you're saying. And I mean that in a very literal way. This is how much it was of a police state it was. So for him to say, we have 64,000 terrorists in the country, everybody knew that was a lie. But those were the things that he was saying. So no, it was impossible to have a Tunisian revolution. It was inevitable that, this is, that he was going to hold on. But I don't think anybody of the people who went on the streets really thought about the, this quantity of death and this quantity of displacement. Um, and 
the, his allies stood by him, and, and the opposition really didn't have a, an honest ally at all. I don't think that Russia can help um, with getting rid of Assad because Russia is bombing on behalf of Assad. So, so, but Lina, it sounds like what you're describing, and you know, Ambassador Ford, you know this quite well too. I've heard you give recent talks where you've described the Rococo security apparatus that Syria has. Not one secret police, but four secret police. And knowing this, why didn't you, you know, Lina's telling you, they knew that Assad is not going to go peacefully. Remember, there's the sectarian dimension in this country that the ruling regime has a sectarian coloration. It's basically drawn from about 14% of the population who are Alawis. We know that there's this, they were going to fight to the death. And so, you know, it was probably never realistic, as you said, to expect a, a Tunisian scenario. But now thinking forward, he's never going to go. So is Mr. Herdig right that, look, if we want to get to some stability in Syria, we've, there's got to be a place for Assad, and there's got to be a place for that regime. And we've got to work with the Russians and the Iranians to do that. Well, you're shaking your head. So I want to actually get all three of you to comment on that. Maybe we'll start with Mr. Herdig, and then we'll go on. Well, I would just ask the same question. Uh, how are you going to get rid of it? Uh, are you going to put boots on the ground? You're going to send in the Americans? Uh, that's not going to happen, I don't think. So, um, what, what's what's going to get him out of there? I'm thinking of the chemical weapons uh, fiasco where Obama said there was a red line and they used the weapons and crossed the red line and we didn't do anything. But it was the Russians who forced him to get rid of the, the, the weapons. Um, and my own feeling is that if they cut off the supplies, uh, they can probably you know, get him out. Uh, but I may be hopelessly naive in that. And I'm, I guess I'm waiting to hear a practical plan that's going to get him um, out of there. How would that, how do you envision that happen? I don't know whether this is the next question. I mean, both, both of you, yes. So we'll start with you. He won't go until he has to go. Yes. So there has to be pressure on him. This is my personal feeling. I was in Iraq for five years trying to get the American Army out of Iraq. And the last thing in the world I want is for the American Army to go into Syria. Yes, I think everybody's agreed. Uh, I'm not even happy that the American Air Force is doing regular combat runs in eastern Syria against Islamic State. I was even against that. I think we should have had Syrians doing that not American pilots. So, but, um, last summer, Assad was sober. He understood he was losing. The Russians have changed that, but I think the Russians have escalated, and the only way then to get back to where we were last summer is you have to give more help to the armed opposition. There's just no other way. The alternative to that is to see the country partitioned which I think is where the Russians ultimately are ready to go, which leaves Assad in control of basically, if I can, I love maps. Uh, Assad will control, sorry, oh, I love, oh, this is so cool, this is the state part of this game, this. So, <laughs> you think, I'm kidding. So, Assad would control basically this line here, up to the Turkish border. He would control that little sliver. That little sliver is actually where the biggest cities are, like Aleppo, where Lina is from. Here's the capital down here, Damascus. This is, this is where the population is. This area out here is desert, except along the river uh, valley there, the Euphrates. Tigris is up there. So, uh, Assad would have this in the partition, which is where we're going. Kurds are going to have this area up here. They've already taken it. And guess who has this? Yeah, the Islamic State. Who's going to get rid of the Islamic State? Assad? Assad, you have, Assad can't even take this. How's he going to go all the way out here? Think of the logistics. Think of all the supply trucks. Ever heard of an insurgency? The Americans couldn't even hold this. Our forces, with all their kind
telecommunications and their air support. We couldn't control this until we got Iraqi Sunni Arabs to control it. I was there, I saw it. How's Assad going to control this? He doesn't have the soldiers. So what we're going to get, I'm afraid, I love your pointer, is um, we're going to get this situation where Assad is there, but guess who else is there? Islamic State. And there just is no, there's no force to go out there unless we're going to send in the Americans. I don't want that. So I would much prefer that we concentrate on getting Assad to negotiate a new government. Maybe he stays, but his four secret police chiefs and their deputies go. And if he doesn't have that security <laughs> apparatus to protect him, maybe then he'll leave. It has to be negotiated. I'm not a diplomat, and I'm not a military expert, and I can't. I don't see things this way. I don't. I see things in a way of what's acceptable as human beings and what's not. And I feel that things can happen when world forces decide that it should happen. I mean, I don't think people said, do we have a realistic way to get rid of Hitler? I don't think people asked that question. I think people said, he's killed enough people that he has to be gone. And we cannot live in a world where we have leaders. It's acceptable for leaders to be that way. We just don't, that's not acceptable. I don't know, I guess for Syria, we just have to wait until we have more and more people or more refugees flood Europe until it's just not acceptable to have them anymore. But this man has been, and his regime, not alone, has been responsible for over 95% of the deaths, 95% of the destruction, and 95% of the refugees. I guess he hasn't caused enough damage for the world to say enough and for never again to apply to Syrians. I think it's unacceptable for us to be living in this world, to be watching these mass crimes, um, to be watching the, the, the torture pictures, to be watching the people who are drowning every single day, 10 Syrians drown, trying to get from, Gre from Turkey to Greece because they don't have the right passport. Uh, it's, it's wrong. What's happening is wrong on, on, on all of humanity's level. And yes, if we want to sit around and the war in Iraq was wrong, and a lot of what humanitarian intervention that's happened in the past has been done in the way that has left things worse than it was before. That's all true. But the fact that we have done humanitarian intervention in a wrong way in this world does not mean that there are cases where humanitarian intervention are necessary. People are dying of starvation in Syria. I have here from the Karam team, Ammar and Muhammad. You can talk to them after. Just last month when people in Madaya were starving, we were, it was a team of 10 people here and probably 50 people in Syria killing ourselves to try to, try to get these tiny bags of, of, of um, dried milk to, to, to kids who are dying of starvation, not because there's a famine, because there are checkpoints and all of the food and all of the aid is lined up behind these checkpoints. And the UN is standing there, and we, and we it's acceptable to live in a world where the UN, um, the head of the UN in Syria goes in and comes out and gives an interview in, in the newspapers and said, yes, a Syrian teen just starved, died of starvation right in front of my eyes, and the food is there, but it's okay, and it's okay for Samantha Power to tweet and say, you know what, I think Assad is bombing, still using chemical weapons. They're using the chemical weapons again, even after the red line, and they put it in tweets. That's what we accept, expect from the American government, from, the, from, the, from Europe, from the UN. It's unacceptable. But I think what's happened in Syria has not become unacceptable enough for the world to end it. But when people decide they want to end it, they will find a way. So ideally, what you'd like to see... national community intervene in Syria in a muscular way to both remove Assad and restore some kind of order. Absolutely, and stop the bombing. And people cannot, they can't be dropping barrel bombs. They can't be dropping Russian missiles. And all of this, on top of it, the Russian missiles and the barrel bombs, what they say that they're bombing ISIS, nobody is fighting ISIS. On top of all of that, we're watching our people die every single day. We're, and not only our people die, Karam Foundation, all these organizations, if you're looking at the top where Idlib is, Idlib is the province that was liberated first, 
And this is the place where it was easiest for humanitarian aid to actually function in there. And we've created not only us, us and many other organizations. We've created bakeries, we've created hospitals, we've built, rebuilt schools. There is civil society happening. That's exactly what's being targeted by Russia. Our own water well was bombed. Our own schools were bombed. This is what they're targeting. What Anything that Syrians were able to build in the last five years have been targeted in the last three, four months. I mean, it's unacceptable. So Andy, how do you respond to this very uh, powerful moral claim? Well, I would say that the starving people who are in these areas that are closed off will, in fact, die long before the, United, uh, the international community ever gets its act together, if it ever will. Um, and it's not clear how much threat there has to be for other people to want to commit um, their soldiers or their resources to doing this. In the meantime, if this agreement that's been arranged holds, food supplies are in fact getting into these people now. That's Whether that, you can say, well, I suppose that takes the pressure off because now these people are kept alive even at a very low, low level. But you know, in a way that seems so cynical to expect these people to die so that it will create enough outrage so that the international community will in fact react when there is no guarantee that the international community will ever react. The, uh, as you point out, the the examples of interventions, particularly armed interventions, in, um, in the Middle East have been uh, a disaster. Uh, and so it would seem to me that some sort of diplomacy is, is probably more fruitful. And I, I guess I would agree with Ambassador Ford that you were opposed to using military force, and I agree with you entirely, given the given the results that we've, we've had. So um, what sort of diplomacy would you be thinking of that might solve this? Well, I'm not of force. I'm not opposed to Syrian rebels using force, Syrian on Syrian. That I think, uh, I don't think in a situation where you have a war, I don't think you can make progress uh, just by being nice um, or trying to convince the other side that, oh, wait, you know, there's another way to do this. I, Usually in a war, what's happening on the ground has an impact on the negotiations. Um, I don't normally like to uh, uh, buttress my arguments by quoting Al Capone. But in this case, I will. <laughs> Al Capone once said, yeah, you could get some good things with kind words, but you could get a lot more with kind words and a gun. <laughs> so in a war situation and where you're dealing with a regime with four secret police services and a president that thinks nothing, and we have to say this, he really thinks nothing of killing civilians. I think there's got to be some element of military pressure to complement, not to replace, but to complement the diplomatic efforts. Um, Dave Petraeus, who was uh, the American commander who helped mobilize those Iraqi Sunnis in Western Iraq to fight Al Qaeda that actually enabled our soldiers finally to leave, um, was in front of the Congress about maybe two months ago in front of the House Armed Services Committee. And he made the same point that it's good to try diplomacy, but the diplomacy also has to have an element of force behind it in order to work. And so I don't view them as uh, mutually. Uh, inconsistent or exclusive, I actually view them as complimentary. So, so, you know, Ambassador Ford, I'm so glad that you mentioned uh, General Petraeus' testimony because what was his precise proposal in Syria? It wasn't simply that we should arm some unnamed rebels. He had actually some very specific rebel groups that he wanted to arm. His proposal was that we should uh, peel away moderate elements of Jebhat and Nusra which is uh, the offshoot of Al-Qaeda, which is an organization that brought to you something known as September 11th, 2001. And so it sounds like you're endorsing that proposal. That's where we are right now, seeing that we're going to back nice elements of Al-Qaeda? Well, let's talk, let's talk about that. So first of all, uh, Dave did not suggest only arming them. It was actually taught of a set of groups that are already getting some help from us, but not very much. 
Um, they're mostly secular. They're mostly composed of soldiers from the Syrian army who defected. These are groups, I'll give you some names, you can Google them. Uh, 13th Division, 101st Division, uh, the Knights of Righteousness in Arabic for Saddle uh, Hot, 1st Coastal Division, they operate up north of Bantamia. Um, these are mostly secular groups. Are uh, Ahrar Hashem in that list too? I wouldn't arm Ahrar Hashem myself. I'd talk to them, but I wouldn't give them arms. So now what Dave was saying was that a lot of the people who joined the Nusra Front, the al Qaeda Front, are themselves just frustrated young Syrian men who have not studied Islamic theology in any great detail and are not committed jihadis who are seeking to take jihad from Syria one day to the streets of New York or Washington or Chicago. Uh, but rather they joined the Nusra Front because the Nusra Front pays them better Lean is talking about refugees. Remember that the people who are fighting Assad, the rebel groups, their families are in refugee camps. They're not at home. They're unemployed. They have no money. And so the people who are fighting do get salaries. And the Al-Qaeda affiliate in Syria pays them. Um, it depends location to location. But the average amount that Al-Qaeda pays is around $400 a month. The non-Al-Qaeda groups, by the way, including the ones that we support, are paying somewhere in the neighborhood of $150 to $200 a month. So if you're trying to help your family, and Syrian families are often large with lots of kids, um, $200 extra dollars goes a long way. So what Dave is saying is, instead of having Nusra pay them, why don't we pay them? Now, the leaders of, El, of the Nusra Front, the Al-Qaeda affiliate in Syria, they're loyal to Ayman Zawahri off there in the cave in Pakistan. And we're not going to peel him away. And we're not going to peel his top leaders away. But a lot of the fighters on the street never joined Nusra out of ideological conviction. They joined Nusra because Nusra paid better, Nusra had more ammunition, Nusra had food, and the other groups didn't. We can ask, and it would be a good question to ask, why did Nusra have all those other things that the other groups didn't? That'd be a great question. We can discuss that. But until those other groups that I mentioned, 13th Division, 101st Division, First Son of others, it's a list, uh, until they're able to better compete for recruits, we're going to have this no sort of problem. So I think Dave's right. This, by the way, was done and worked and worked in Iraq. And worked in Iraq. How do you think we got our troops out? Yes. Iraqis did the fighting. How did we get them to do that? We paid them! Well, that's true, but that was done through the tribal uh, chieftains. We still pay the tribal chieftains. We can well, do well, something. I guess my question to you would be that we, we have taken this, uh, we, we have proposed that. We're going to work with moderate insurgents, moderate rebels. And we haven't been able, we spent $500 million with some group, and we got five. But I, I realize that's probably an extreme case. But we, this, this policy, we haven't seen been able to find the right groups or give them the right aid or whatever. So if these groups are, if it's simply a matter of providing more money so that they're paid better, um, why is it that that doesn't work? Okay. Can I talk about that? Yeah, please. Okay. But I want to get to Lena uh, in a minute. But no, talk about that, but then. I love maps. So, uh, the program you're talking about, Andy, was to fight the Islamic State, not to fight Assad. Not to fight Assad. The 500 million was to train people to go down and fight in this area. There's Raqqa. That's the so-called capital of the Islamic State. This, there have been a lot of fighting. Those of you following the war today, today, you know there's been a lot of fighting right here in the last week to fight in this area, not to fight Bashar al-Assad. Now, we had $500 million. So the US military, CENTCOM, they're, they're following instructions. The instructions from the White House are, you train a force to go fight the Islamic State, not Assad. The president does not want them to fight Assad. Presidential orders. The military goes out here and tries to recruit and says, we'll pay you, we'll give you arms, we'll help you fight the Islamic State. The Syrian fighters are like, okay, I'll fight 
the Islamic State. But what about Assad? The Americans said, oh, no, 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 no. You can't fight Assad. You can only fight the Islamic State. The fighters all said, oh, no, no. We don't like the Islamic State. We'll fight them. But we must also fight Assad. We are not going to sign up for something that doesn't deal with the underlying problem. The Americans actually wanted them to sign oaths saying they would not fight Assad. And they refused. That's where we got 50. Only 50 people would agree to do that. Now you might say, what's the matter? The Islamic State is horrible. Why wouldn't they fight the Islamic State? The Islamic yes, State, worse. the Islamic State, according to several different human rights organizations, has killed one seventh as many civilians in Syria as Assad. I'm going to say that in a much better way. Assad has killed seven times more people <laughs> than the Islamic State. So if you're a Syrian, if you're a Syrian, what's the biggest problem? The Americans said, no, you have to sign this paper that you won't fight Assad. Before we give you bullets, before we give you money, before we get, they got 50. Those 50 came down into here and in brilliant military planning, the Americans put them right next to the Nusra Front people we were just talking about that the Americans had bombed literally two days before. And when the Nusra people saw them, they said, who the hell are you? They said, oh, we're here from, the Americans have trained us to go fight the Islamic State. And the Nusra people said, there are no Islamic State around here. You're clearly here from the Americans to attack us. And the Nusra people surrounded them and captured them. It was such a clumsy operation. I mean, they should have been inserted. If you were going to send in 50, you wouldn't send them over here. You'd send them back over here. <laughs> and this is what happened. So that program didn't work. But now I want to talk about the other thing that I'm shot. As I said to the group this afternoon, last July, Bashar al-Assad gave the following speech to his country. You can Google it, look it up. He said, our army is tired. We're running out of soldiers. We have a severe manpower shortage. We cannot defend all of the places in Syria that we need to defend. We are now going to have to start withdrawing, pulling back. They were actually pulling forces back all in here in the north and down here in the south, pulling back substantially. Assad said to, uh, I think he was speaking in front of his parliament, we will have to start withdrawing. We are too weak to defend everywhere. When I heard that, I thought, finally, he's beginning to feel real pressure. Finally, he's going to understand he's going to have to make some compromises. Five weeks after that speech, the Russians started bombing. And of course, the reason is they were trying to prop him up before he fell. So in order to get back to where Assad is willing to make compromises, we have to go back to getting more pressure on him through these same Syrian rebels. The ones who were putting the pressure on were the ones that we, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, some European countries I don't think I'm supposed to name, are helping. So there was the silly American program against the Islamic State, which has since been stopped. And there was the separate program against Assad, which was doing actually what it was supposed to do until the Russians intervened. So now the Russians have raised. We either give up and let Iraq be partitioned, as I said, or we raise our own side. So after all of that, what you've said, what you've said, what you've said, um, as a Syrian, I mean, and if you can imagine a Syrian watching this chain of events, the way that you're describing them, in their mind, they're saying, are all of these American mistakes? Or are these American intentions? And, and has America ever been the friend of the opposition? And that's what Syrians are thinking now and have been thinking for a long time. That this cannot be a series of mistakes by the American government and, by the, and, and this cannot be what, what, what was being asked of the opposition to do and to perform, on, not only on the military level, on the political level as well, has um, ended with the result of the Syrian
you're in opposition basically <laughs> thinking that everybody in the world is against us and nobody is, and actually in, in its own way, is America actually backing the Assad regime even though they keep saying, like oh, President Obama said today, Assad must go, but re in reality nobody really wants Assad to go. And that's I think what the framework of Syrians are to today. I think, you know, the comedy of errors you just described does not really inspire a lot of confidence in our future ability to back the, the right people and to lead to some kind of uh, positive outcome in Syria. But I guess I just want to step back for a second and ask a bigger question that we haven't really addressed and maybe Mr. Herdig and, and you can address. What is the U.S. interest in Syria? It sounds like we can do this kind of these silly things because really there's no pressing U.S. interest there to begin with. So maybe we'll start with Mr. Herbert. What's our interest there? Well, I think Ambassador Ford is probably, <laughs> I think too, as Gus said, it's a moral interest probably. Uh, and you have to raise the question to what extent do, um, does morality define your foreign policy? It can put you on a slippery slope. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was once quoted as teaching the Mexicans to elect good men, which got us involved in a lot of um, Mexican politics and it didn't turn out well. And intervention, well, we, we thought we were liberating um, Iraq. So it could be a problem, but in this case, this clearly a humanitarian crisis, people are dying and so forth. Uh, but. The problem, I think, is that the American public has lost its interest in committing um, troops. And the, the problem of creating uh, an adequate force on the ground to do something about this is complicated. The Kurds are some of the most effective fighting <coughs> group, as I understand it, but supporting them alienates us from Turkey, which doesn't want the Kurds to be strengthened because it will strengthen the Kurds within Turkey who they're trying to, the Turks are trying to keep down. So um, I think you've raised an interesting question or a very important question about what's our practical interest. I suppose it would be to contain, if you wanted to be amoral about this, would be to contain the conflict and make sure it doesn't spread somewhere else, whether that's possible or not, given um, ISIS presence in Syria and the terrorism that it fosters and the refugee crisis, uh, that's caught, caught the attention of the rest of the world. Um, so to the extent that doing something about Syria would uh, somehow get rid of ISIS, I suppose that would be the, the <coughs> practical, um, if you're looking for a practical. So, so if our interest is purely in alleviating the refugee crisis, then it seems to me that what you, uh, in alleviating the human suffering, then what you need to do is get to some sort of stable order in that country. And then what the Russians are doing looks a lot more constructive than what you want to do, right? Because at least the Russians, and Lena, you're going to tell me why I'm wrong, but let me just play this out. What the Russians are trying to do is prop up a pre-existing state. What we're trying to do, or what you're trying to do, is take these nebulous rebel groups with a wide variety of aims and interests, some of which are blood-curdlingly horrifying, and somehow hope that by supporting the right mix of these people, we can both unseat a deeply rooted state and create some new state and a new democracy. Doesn't that seem like a much bigger lift and a much harder road to, to travel towards stability than doing what the Russians are doing, which is let's just prop up the free existing state? Well, for two reasons I disagree with you. Number one, I don't accept that uh, we don't know who to work with. Uh, the American program with the 500 million, as I talked about, is different from the other groups we've been helping against outside. And those groups were, let me be clear, they were winning last summer until the Russians stepped in. They were winning. So you can say they're nebulous and we don't know who they are. With all due respect, I just named some groups. If you want me to name more, I will. Well, we know they who they are, and there are a lot of groups. But they're not, Tarek, there are maybe 10 that count. Yes, there are 1,500 if you go by the list. Most of those 1,500 are like three guys 
with a Kalashnikov in a garage four years ago. That's not serious. The serious groups are, are maybe ten. You can look at these are fugitive states. They can I didn't the say they're states. states. I said there are groups. There's a huge difference, as we both know. So, but we're not trying to supplant one state with another state. We're trying to get to a negotiation. And getting to a negotiation is a different thing than trying to win militarily. They're not the same thing. In fact, my experience in Iraq is even people who hate each other can sometimes negotiate. But they don't do it unless they feel compelled to do so. So I'm just talking about how do you get to a negotiation. Now what you're saying the Russians are trying to do is reasonable, but we must understand the implication. The implication is that Assad controls that little strip in the West that I talked about. There is no reconstruction, except whatever the Russians with low oil prices can finance, and the Iranians with their one-time gift of $100 billion from uh, nuclear sanctions relief. Beyond that, they don't have any money either. And oh, by the way, the Iranians have an economic mess at home too. You keep reading about the Saudi economic mess, it's much worse in Iran. So whatever money there is to rebuild Syria, it isn't going to be enough for the refugees who are already out of the country, that's 3.5 million. These are the people that leave us talking about crossing on the boats. These are the people causing political problems in Germany. These are the people whose arrival has compelled the British government to say maybe we're going to have to pull out of the European <coughs> Union. That problem is not going to be fixed. In fact, it'll probably get worse because as the economic conditions deteriorate, more people will leave. There's no reconstruction. There's no economic growth. The Russians don't have a plan to rebuild Syria. They won't even be able to go in the eastern four-fifths of Syria. And that leaves the Islamic State. You may say, well, that's not a big problem. I would say it's not going to bring down the United States. But I do think we're going to have more San Bernardino sooner or later. I hate to say that. I hope I am wrong. I sincerely hope I am wrong. But the grim reality is I'm probably right. Well, do you think that these groups of controlling Assad could then form some sort of stable government in the area to the east of that strip? I think you talked about it. Uh, you know, the strip didn't include Aleppo, for instance. So that they could reoccupy those areas, Aleppo, maybe, I don't know, Damascus. So they, they still hold them. Yeah. And if there's just a ceasefire with no political deal, they'll continue to hold them. And so the country will be kind of a little checkerboard um, with groups, but with one big black area in the sort of middle and southeast, Kurdish area in the northeast, and Assad controlling that. I don't know, what is it? One fifth, one sixth in the east? That's what I'm thinking is, is stopping the fighting would seem to be a prelude to doing anything, if, uh, getting food or reconstructing or, or whatever. If stopping the fighting means conceding a strip on the coast to stop leaving him, does that would that possibly lead to uh, uh, some sort of ceasefire or truce that would allow um, the other areas of the country, uh, countries, uh, areas like Aleppo and some of the other major cities, to receive aid and begin reconstruction? I think they could receive aid. I doubt there'll be much money for reconstruction. I mean, who's gonna? We can pay for that. Well, I mean, who's going to pay for it? Well, maybe we would if we thought it was really going to work. Um, it kind of begs the question, though, before you're going to sink a lot of money into a country for reconstruction, you'd sort of like to know what's the political future of the country. So, Lena, Ambassador Ford's policy proposal is pretty clear, right? What we want to do, in Ambassador Ford's words, are fund rebel groups to continue the fighting in Syria, to fight to a stalemate. So, this policy prescription is more fighting, uh, is this what you were hoping to hear? No. <laughs> I mean, I know that nothing anybody is going to say is what we hope to hear. So it's not your fault. <laughs> but, I mean, honestly, to be... <laughs> but, no, I mean, to say that Russia is the, on the right track to try to keep something similar to what we had before is, first of all, no, but the Syrians don't want what they had before. 
because it was terrifying and, our, and, and they don't want what they had before that created what we have now, which is a murderous regime. So that is out of the question and Russia is killing Syrians every day and that is wrong. It's wrong. So that's, I mean, that's, Syrians want the fighting to stop. ISIS is alien to Syrian culture. ISIS did not exist in 2011 when this whole thing started. Syria, and when people, and I want Americans, and especially the young people here, because when I speak to schools, they often um, express their fear of ISIS, their personal fear of ISIS, because it is so scary. And I want you all to think about, when you do think that you're scared of ISIS, I want you to think about the millions of Syrians who actually live in areas under ISIS control and live terrified every single day. These Syrians are against ISIS and they are against Assad. And, and there's millions of Syrians living under siege of ISIS and they're the ones who actually have live in a lot of fear. So if Syrians don't want ISIS, they don't want Assad, they want to live in dignity and freedom, exactly what they came out on the streets in, in March 2011, and I think they're going to continue on. And, and you know what? The history professor knows all wars end. One day this war will end. And if it's going to take a decade, if it's going to take two decades, Syrians will not go home because they are not afraid anymore. They're not even afraid of death. So, I think this is a good note for us to begin taking some questions from this really extraordinary and patient audience. We've got about 15 minutes um, left. So, um, why don't we, uh, are there microphones? I think there are microphones. There's one here. So, questions for the audience, uh, for, from the audience for any of our panelists. Otherwise, I'm going to, uh, okay, please, well, why don't you come up to the, uh, to the microphone? Or, Do I really I have to? I think I can be here. Okay. Um, Tuesday evening at the Humanitarian uh, Symposium on the subject of the refugees, one of the speakers said that not very long ago, the Syrian people had no religious strife. Your neighbor could be... Uh, Jewish, Christian, you could be Muslim, and they all got along fine. So, but this must be a very naive question, but knowing that Russia is involved in Syria because uh, Assad was perceived as a socialist, um, I just don't understand whether Assad was always a murderous tyrant, or if not, then what made him so? That, that's a great question. I think, Lena, you're, you're well positioned to answer it first, and then Ambassador Ford, you've had some first-hand experience with it. Yes, he always has been a murderous tyrant, um, and his father before him. And it's very doc well documented what the Assad regime has done to the Syrian people and how many people they've killed openly and in their um, torture prisons. Um, and you're very right, uh, Syria is a very diverse country. This is another myth that's portrayed in the media that Assad is the secularist and the protector of minorities. And it's very, it, this is a very untrue statement. Um, first of all, the Assad is protective of nobody but themselves. And also, Syria has been a diverse country for thousands of years with all religions and all sects and all different kinds of ethnicities. And the Assad regime did not teach Syrians how to love each other and how to coexist. I'm from the city of Aleppo, the city of Christians, Muslims, Armenians, Jews, all different kinds of people. This is how we've been for thousands of years. Um, and, but it's just the way that it's portrayed in the media that, that he is the protector of minorities, but he is a protector of nobody but himself. I'm happy to tell the story, but, but I'd like to respond directly to your question about it seemed that before people from different religious uh, communities got along well in ethnic communities. My perspective, it was always divided, at least on some level. 80%, um, 80%, 
of the officers in the Syrian military and in the Syrian security <coughs> services were Alawi. That's even before the uprising. When the uprising started and got big, remember I mentioned that some of the soldiers defected? So what the regime did was they put units that were mostly Alawi soldiers under Alawi officers, and they put them up against the protesters, and they were the guys shooting. So what happened over a period of months, there were initially Alawis in the protesters, and there were Christians in the protest movement. But over time, as Alawi soldiers were shooting at basically Sunni protesters in a lot of the places, it became nasty sectarian. And it didn't take much to set off. There was an underlying fire there that didn't take much to flame up. So yes, there was intermarriage. There was an Iraq too, but that didn't stop the Iraqis from going on a civil war rampage. So I, I've heard Syrians say this many times. There's an element of truth to it, but it's not the entire truth. The regime itself was always sectarian. Always. Even today, that I get into these arguments with people on Twitter about it. But <laughs> the this, this system was always sectarian. There were no, I want to be very clear about this, there were zero Sunnis in a position of authority high enough to move troops to manipulate secret police services in a way that would have threatened the president. There were Alawis, but not Sunnis. The system was set up that way. Assad regime system, though, yeah. but not the country itself and its history. But Sunnis knew that, yes, and so they were angry that they were always sort of second-class citizens. If you were a Sunni military officer, your chances of promotion to the top grades were always less than ours. But there, there is significant <laughs> Sunni support for uh, for the regime. Absolutely, there is significant um, support, mainly from a sort of um, what I would call shopkeeper businessman class. Not all of them, but some of them um, are still supporting Assad. Some of the rich uh, business families left the country and are now in places like Dubai or California or some of them. Um, but there's still some support, for sure. And I have to say, I, uh, I've, I've criticized the regime tonight a lot. The Syrian opposition is atrocious. They're politically stupid. Uh, they are themselves, I think, very sectarian now. They have become very sectarian, which is a very bad. Uh, and, uh, you know, the things I'm talking about, giving help to those armed groups, I don't want to do that for free. The first thing I tell them is, you're going to bring some alloys into your top management. Because if you're not sectarian, you would have alloys there. And if they squawk, I'd say, well then, there's nothing we can do because we're not interested in helping you pursue your sectarian agenda. I have said that to them and they just kind of look at me. I think when you get to the stage where a U.S. ambassador has to tell opposition groups what kind of sectarian makeup they need to have, we've already lost. But can you answer her question about an Assad and was he always a bad guy? Was he? Did we always know he was going to be this uh, react in this bloodthirsty and brutal way? Well, as I said, we got these nice words from their presidency, their security advisors, and from their foreign ministry. So you sort of get that message. But I, I recall, uh, and this is what Andy was asking about, my very first meeting with Bashar al-Assad in January, very end of January 2011, where I, we were, my first meeting with him, I present the letter from Obama that names me the ambassador, et cetera. And, uh, so we had a conversation, uh, last about an hour. Assad speaks fluent English, absolutely fluent. Studied ophthalmology in Britain. And his wife, Esma, uh, worked for Citibank uh, in London. Uh, she was in their uh, uh, banking division there in London. Um, in fact, Esma told me once she almost went to Harvard, um, but she married Bashar instead. So, uh, I, I leave that to you to decide if that was a good choice or not. So, anyway, so we're having this kind of, I wouldn't say uh, uh, 
friendly but polite conversation where we're talking about things like Syrian support for terrorist groups like Hezbollah, and he doesn't deny it. He just says, you know, they're fighting Israel, we fight Israel, you know, we're going to continue. Uh, where we talked about their programs of uh, chemical weapons, and mass destruction, and the need to have their facilities inspected, he said, we have no such facilities. Uh, there he lied, he didn't even try to hide it. Um, and then when I mentioned human rights, and I raised the case of two human rights activists that had been in prison for years without trial, um, what had been kind of a, just a jousting conversation, and he sat up straight, and he kind of looked down, and he's very tall, and he said, after Guantanamo, and after Abu Ghraib, and after Afghanistan, the last country I'm going to take any advice from on human rights is the United States. And I said to him, well, you know, Mr. President, it's perfectly reasonable for you to raise Abu Ghraib and Afghanistan and Guantanamo. I said, you know, we put American soldiers who committed abuses in Abu Ghraib in prison. And we have uh, tried people in front of military tribunals for things that have happened in Afghanistan. People have lost their jobs. Uh, and they have been removed. Um, Guantanamo, the president, wants to close. So, but I said, I think you've asked reasonable questions. In each of those cases, we have a lot to answer for. I don't deny it. And I am perfectly prepared to discuss all of those with you or the designated members of your government that you want to have me talk to about it. But I said, but we will raise human rights questions with you and your government. And if we hope to have better relations, we're going to have to have an honest dialogue and see some progress. And he said, well, I don't want to discuss this anymore. But he got quite angry about it. So my message to Washington that night was, you know, approachable, you can talk to him, he's not particularly uh, pompous, but who is he sensitive on the human rights stuff? Well, the reason I asked uh, Ambassador Ford to tell that story is because he looks very reasonable. I mean, when he was on the Charlie Rose program, he was, he looked uh, very reasonable. I think he really, he ran Charlie Rose in circles. Uh, and so you think that you're talking to somebody who um, is, is going to be reasonable, but there is this side to, to, to him that um, you've just heard. And also the point that's been raised, if you're, uh, Alloway in charge, and this is like riding the tiger. Um, it's dangerous to stay on as, as uh, protests rise. Getting off, you're going to be the subject of uh, retributions if, if the um, opponents are in control, and so you fight to the last man. Okay, do we have more questions? So just come up to the, we've got a lot of people here, so I'm just, you sir, and just come up to the mic, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a comment and a question, if you don't mind. Uh, I am a Syrian American, and to the lady's point, I'm a Muslim Sunni, born and raised in Damascus, and I actually went to a Catholic school in Abdumo, and to make it worse, I went to a Catholic Armenian school. <laughs> uh, in uh, my, uh, my comment is, Ambassador Ford mentioned that the Russian wants to condition Syria. But we also believe that what the U.S. government is doing by supporting the separatist Kurds in the north is actually helping in, 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 in what the Russians want. The Kurds are advancing, taking lands from the Free Syrian army uh, with the help of the Russian war plane at the same time. And the uh, U.S. government is actually uh, arming the Kurds. So we do believe that this is an issue and everybody wants to partition the country, not just the Russians. And this is very hurtful to any Syrian, including the Kurds, who really don't want to see that. A lot of Kurds don't want to see that. Um, my question is, uh, Secretary Kerry uh, mentioned that if there was a failure in the ceasefire, there would be a plan B. And uh, Bully, Lavrov, the next day said there is no plan B. So do you believe that there is a plan B really if the ceasefire did not work? Thank you. Why don't we start with the ambassador? On the, on the Syrian Kurdish issue, 
Uh, all I can say is I'm glad I'm not a United States government anymore. <laughs> it, it's the sloppiest thing I've seen in a long time. And the Americans, I, 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 many of you I'm sure have heard, the Syrian Kurds are our best allies against the Islamic State. How many of you have heard that? Okay, I'm here to tell you. How many groups in Syria have we given close combat air support to against the Islamic State? Where, like, we have fighters, and the Americans come in and bomb the Islamic State right in front of them so they can advance. How many groups other than Syrian Kurds have we done that for? Zero. How many of those other groups fighting the Islamic State, the ones that, by the way, Tarak, all the groups I mentioned to you are also fighting the Islamic State, how many of those groups have asked for American air support and been refused? Answer, all of them. Why? Because they're also fighting Assad and the Americans don't want to get too involved in that. So the Syrian Kurds, as you know, are not fighting Bashar al-Assad very much. They're sort of over in their corner, fixing it up for themselves. I think, actually, and I've said this to people in Washington when I go there, I live in northern Vermont now, as far from Washington as I can be. But when I do go to Washington and talk to them, I have warned them, you are setting up a future war. I was in Iraq. I saw how the Kurds there ended up getting in fights with the Arabs. You are setting this up long term for instability. And do you know what they say to me? Well, our priority right now is the Islamic State. I, it's so short-sighted, it's irresponsible. And that's all I have to say. Do you see plan B? Yes, there is no plan B. If they had plan B, they would have used it already. I also got a question today on Facebook because I asked people to ask me what to ask you, and they said, is there a plan P? Partition, partition. I think in the end, I think the Americans may accept the partition. Just the reality is if they can get the ceasefire. You know what Joe Biden said the other day? When he was in Turkey three weeks ago, he said, well, if we can't get the political deal we need in Syria, then we'll pursue the military strategy against the Islamic State. And that's what he said. So we have time really for one more question. And uh, what I'd like is there to be some gender balance. So we've had the men, so is there, can we get um, you, ma'am, in the first row? Yeah, and just get you and just come to this. Right, and this will be the last question. Make it a question. Uh, speech. Or... Okay, so I know, Mr. Ambassador, your main proposal for what you think the best option would be would kind of be stalemate leading to negotiations. But I guess my question is, if we had these negotiations, isn't that kind of assuming Assad is still in power? So that's really not fixing the root problem. So how would that lead to stability? How would that not fall apart right away? Great question. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think you have to negotiate with Assad. Uh, he's not, you can't demand that he depart as a precondition. So he will for sure, for sure, for sure, be there during the negotiations. Absolutely. It'll be his delegation with which there are negotiations in Geneva. Uh, afterwards, whether or not he stays after the negotiation, when they set up a new government, that, to me, is something that has to be negotiated. I, myself, have said to the Syrian opposition, there must be certain conditions under which you could stand having him there for a year or two. And they, I mean, they just whine and they can't imagine. And I say, you know, think about what other things you would need in order to leave him there. And that's what you may end up having to ask for. I don't know. So, but during the negotiation, you're absolutely right. And Worse news than that, the negotiations will take a long time. So, so I'm, I'm told that we may actually be able to continue and go on a little bit more. Michael, is that possible? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. So, 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 um, you know, with respect to this question about Assad, you know, very good question. You know, just let me articulate sort of the alternative. The interest of the bombing was supposed to stop. So, if it in fact does stop, that's a positive sign. But probably the torture and so forth, that's going to be more complicated to monitor. One, one of the, one of the, is it one of the uh, points in the resolution is that the, the political prisoners must be released? Um, uh, you mean resolution 2254? 
I'm not sure. I think it says they must start doing this. Not that they all have to be released. Can I say something on that? I think Mr. Gurley wants to make an announcement and then we'll. Those of you who need to get on with your homework uh, may certainly leave. Those of you who would like to stay and engage the panelists more directly, come up front and fire your questions away. Okay. two meetings where the Syrian opposition came and a delegation from Bashar al-Assad's government came to Geneva under United Nations auspices in January and February 2014. We were hoping to get a negotiation for a new uh, transition of government. That's what the invitation from Ban Ki-moon said. The Russians looked at the language of the invitation letter beforehand and agreed to it. Uh, so we thought we were actually going to get a negotiation. <coughs> Turned out it was the Syrian government delegation had instructions from Damascus not to discuss anything political. So the, the opposition delegation, in sort of frustration and hoping to get something out of the talks, said, well, could you start releasing political prisoners? This is a true story. I was not in the room, but this has been confirmed to me by multiple sources, Syrian and United Nations. So they said, well, OK, could you at least start releasing prisoners? And the Syrian delegation had this true story. Bashar al-Khafri is in fact in New York, the United Nations, said, we hold no political prisoners. <laughs> so the opposition said, oh, come on. We know you do, but let's not get into a big argument. How about if you just would release women and children? And he said, we hold no women and we hold no children. That was the end of that day's session. So overnight, the Syrian delegation spent the whole night calling people, human rights organizations, and getting them to email in lists of women and children that were held by the regime, and assembling it. They had this operations room in their hotel. And they literally assembled overnight a stack of paper about that thick with the names of women and children, when they were arrested and where. So they brought it in the next day, and they said, yesterday you said there were no women and children, Here's a list. Now, by the way, the ground rules of that negotiation were they couldn't talk to each other directly. They had to talk to Lashkar Brahimi and the UN team that was sitting at the head of the table. So they would turn to Lashkar and they'd say, please tell him, would you please tell him that this is a list of the names and the dates? And they would give him a picture. Lashkar Brahimi would then say, the opposition has given me the list. This is in front of him. The opposition has given me a list. Here it is. And he would, and he set it down front. The Syrian delegation chief, Bashar al a wonderful thing, uh, refused to pick it up, wouldn't touch it, and simply said, any women we hold are terrorists, and any children we hold will grow up to be terrorists. Now, if you really think you can you know, negotiate with a regime like that by just kind of trying to talk to it, okay. you're the one who wants to negotiate with I said, I said, I said two tracks in parallel. Okay, let's let's get some more uh, some more questions. So, uh, the young man over there, in the blazer, yes, come to the. Yep, you you're standing. It was have, come, come to the mic. Microphone. I think so far tonight, uh, most of the panelists have talked about Russia as kind of an obscure force with one sort of one track mind focused on keeping the Assad, Assad regime in power in Syria. I was wondering if you could talk about some of the Russian interests in the region, in Syria in particular, and whether how much the United States has, if any, potential to work with Russia towards a solution that is amicable to both. It's a great question. Let's start with Mr. Hurdin, and then we'll. Well, Russia's been humiliated when the Soviet Union broke up and lost its status as a great power. And under Putin, I think it's trying to get back to that, to nibble at the edges of the, its territory to see if it can get back some of what it lost and uh, to play a role in foreign affairs. Um, it's had a long time interest. Russia, before the Soviet Union has always wanted a warm water port, access to the Mediterranean, 
They have had a relationship with Syria for quite a long time, and they have a port, uh, a naval base there. And so I, I can see they're trying to get back into the big leagues again. And it also is a way of sticking their thumb in the American's eye, because uh, they, they can, they, as we've heard, um, they've managed to ch change um, the side's position and, and, and strength them. Um, also, I think um, some of the adventures of Putin in the Ukraine may not be going so well, and with the oil prices dropping, there are problems at home, and there's no, no better way to get the public behind you than have a foreign war where you seem to be um, doing great things. What does Russia want? Well, I agree with what Andy just said. I think that's exactly right. I would add two things. Uh, number one, the Russians basically have lost all their friends in the Middle East except for Syria. But what they're doing... Egypt desperately wants to be their friend. And before this is finished, they may have their chance. Um, the Russians are showing everybody, not just in the Middle East, but around the world, that they're reliable friends, that they stick up for their friends. You know, the Americans looked at Hosni Mubarak and said, eh, he's a goner. Out he goes. Uh, the Russians look at Bashar al-Assad and say, oh, you're in trouble, we got to help you. So if you're the ruler of a country, which one would you rather depend on for help? The Americans or the Russians? I think Putin is trying to build Russian credibility that way over the medium and long term. Uh, the second thing which I think he's doing it, it is what you were talking a bit about being back on the map. Um, I think he is trying to show also that he can be helpful, and maybe if you would just listen to what we're saying, you, you Americans, you Europeans, take your sanctions off of us for Crimea, um, and just work with us, we can be constructive. It's very interesting how the Russians in the last 48 hours have been highlighting in their news broadcasts and in their public statements that working with the Americans, they are about to implement a ceasefire for the first time in Syria. They're really trumpeting it, their positive role in this. And it suggests to me that they're sending a message to all of us uh, that they're not always the bad guys like Crimea. Um, and please be concerned to take those icky sanctions off of us. They also, um, he's sticking up for a principle about the sovereignty of nations, that outsiders like the United States shouldn't come in and you know, tinker and overthrow governments and so forth, that the boundaries of the nation are sacrosanct, and, and they're sticking up for the principle of um, protecting the sovereignty of a nation which has been, they would uh, he's accepting um, Assad's claim that they're being attacked by terrorists. They helped undermine in Crimea and Ukraine, so now they're back on it. Yeah, that's correct. It is interesting, though, that we have sort of seen this movie before, this movie in which the <coughs> Russians try to prop up a pretty nasty state, and we, along with our Saudi allies, uh, seem to be participating in the dismantling of the state, in part by supporting some pretty crazy radical Islamic fundamentalists. But this movie, of course, was called Afghanistan. Uh, this before, and it, it didn't end well for us in Afghanistan. If you think in the in the long term, and you maybe think, you know, perhaps the Russians are right here that the alternative, even though I said is terrible. Nobody has yet been able to articulate an alternative that is better, that is more stable, and that doesn't bring potentially to power some groups that have some very uh, retrograde ideas and views. So, anyways, let's let's uh, let's take some more questions. I want to get students, and I'm committed to uh, gender diversity. So, uh, go ahead. We're going to alternate. Hello. Uh, you've talked a lot about the Russian intentions in a very structural and historical way, but I just don't see the same thing for the U.S. intentions. You asked the question, but the answers were um, very abstract. So could you expand on that? 
on, on what does the U.S. want. Yeah, what's the intention of the U.S.? Lena, you seem to have a very strong view on what you think the intention of the U.S. is. Uh, I don't think that the U.S. has the Syrian people's interest at heart. And I think that um, this, the Obama administration's policy of inaction has, is, is very deliberate and actually they know what, their, what the outcome will be out of this policy and they're willing to live with that um, for, the, for the deals that they got with Iran and for making the peace maybe with Russia moving on. I don't think Syria is really important to the United States and that I think that I, th I don't think they have an interest in it at all and, and that's kind of clear from what, what's been going on. The outcome you think the U.S. is happy to see is what, partition? The outcome that the U.S., I think that the Obama administration wants to see is that ISIS doesn't um, expand beyond Syria's borders and whatever else happens, happens. That's what I think. That may be right. Uh, of course, you can say in any country that the interests that they follow are probably their own. So when you say that they probably don't take the Syrian people's interests to heart, that may well be true. I would argue that having had adventures in the Middle East where we were supposed to spread democracy and we, I think, were overreached in trying to do that, and that now we've moved back to our just settling for stability. Uh, and however that can be achieved either working with the Russians or working with whomever because we've seen the whole area as, as a result in fact uh, perhaps of American intervention has been um, completely destabilized with tremendous human costs so maybe we've felt that, that uh, we were arrogant and uh, and thinking we could fix things and so now we're for a little bit I don't know, humble is the right word, probably not, but um, we're pulling back. Ambassador Ford, what, what, are we, what, is, what are we trying to get and what should we be trying to get in a sort of concrete way? The administration's sole concern right now, oh, that's unfair. The administration's top concern is the Islamic State, not Bashar al-Assad, not the fight with the Assad, the opposition. I'll be very clear about that is not their primary concern. Their primary concern is pushing back and destroying the Islamic State in both Iraq and Syria. Anything else for them is gravy. Uh, and because it's only gravy, they're not willing to do very much to achieve anything on that underlying side. And I think the Islamic State is a destabilizing yeah, well, I think I, the main thing they're concerned about is that it'll, it'll eventually strike us even here in the United States. So in a repeat of a sort of 9 11 kind of scenario. Which, by the way, is not an unreasonable fear. But it's also not linked at all to whether or not they control territory in the middle of the Syrian desert. Uh, it certainly helps them to control territory in the Syrian desert. The attack on Paris was planned in the middle of the Syrian desert. Was it really? I, I don't know that the yeah. evidence suggests that. They, they know that the guys who did it were out fighting. They've seen pictures of them now. They've gone back and looked. And they have some evidence that they were actually doing some operational planning. I think San Bernardino suggests that it doesn't take ISIS controlling any territory for us to have radical Islamist inspired acts of terror here. Yeah, but I think the lesson of Al-Qaeda is if you don't control territory, it's harder to do stuff. And the Islamic State's claim to legitimacy is that it's established a caliphate which involves governing some. I, I just think the capacities, Tarek, the capacities of the Islamic State are much greater than Al Qaeda, and that's in part from control of territory. Not solely, but in part. So, also, um, you have the to other. Think about how they were allowed to get into the desert and, and, and settle in there, an open view of these um, coalition planes that could definitely take out. Um, take out a convoy of trucks just driving across the desert with American weapons that they stole from Iraq and not be taken out and let them fester in Palmyra, uh, which is a, 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 like a archaeological site that is important to all of humanity, and then 
weeks later when the Islamic State starts to blow up these sites, we all cry and say we're losing our heritage. But they were allowed to just drive over there, but, so, but why didn't all of these forces that are anti-ISIS actually take them out? We don't know. I don't think anybody's fighting the Islamic State, really. So, so you, you disagree with Ambassador for You don't even see the U.S. really caring about the Islamic State? No, I think they care, but I don't think they're fighting it as long as it stays in Syria. I don't think, I think they, if the Islamic State does not hit anything or be able to expand beyond Syria's borders, it's okay what it's doing inside Syria. So I don't think that, that America or the coalition against ISIS is actually fighting ISIS even. I mean, I, yeah, please. One point, um, again, in answer to your question. I don't know if you're following the news day by day on this, but uh, the day before yesterday, uh, as the ceasefire in Syria approaches, I don't know if you noticed, but President Obama held a conference call with Francois Hollande of France, Angela Merkel of Germany, and David Cameron in Britain. France, Germany. <coughs> Why would he have a conference call with them to talk about the Syrian ceasefire? They're not fighting, and the British really aren't doing much of anything. Syria. They provide a little bit of uh, refugee assistance, but that's about it. But why those France, Germany, Britain? Okay. And it was to talk about the ceasefire. Now, I, the White House statement just says they talked about Syria, and these are the uh, people who talk. This is my guess. Angela Merkel is hurting because of the refugees. David Cameron, against his will, has now decided that he must go to a popular referendum in Britain about the withdrawal of Britain from the European Union. <coughs> Francois Hollande, France being the other great pillar of the European Union, is also suffering because of this. All three of those leaders have a huge problem with the refugees, and all three of those leaders are watching the European Union's very foundations wobbling. I'm not saying it's going to crash. But it's certainly shaking in a way it hasn't shaken in the last 20 years. I think the president was actually more or less compelled to call them and say, we're doing everything we can to get to this ceasefire and try to staunch the flow of these refugees. <laughs> so when you ask, what are the Americans trying to get? Islamic State is like the top priority. But I think. They would like the gravy if they could get it, and the Europeans need that gravy. But the Americans aren't willing to send American troops. They're not willing to send American airplanes. They're even very reluctant, as Tarek has indicated, and for reasons that very much mirror what Tanya has said. They're even very nervous to support the rebels. And so, it really, this is a tough sell for Obama. I mean, I can, that must have been an interesting book. Uh, you, sir. Yes. Um, Ambassador Ford, so you mentioned um, how in your plans, um, well, what you would like to have seen the time before was more backing up of the Syrian rebel groups and hopefully that, that would have led to a stalemate that would have led to a negotiation that would have resolved this conflict. So that means that like, some negotiation would involve you know, the Assad government and an opposition. As we know, before 1,500 groups is you know ridiculous and overstated number. Even 10 groups is still 10 different opposition groups. So I was wondering if the um, panel could talk more about what would unify the opposition. And is that possible? And would that lead to an uh, actual formidable uh, negotiation? Wants to take it. Was directed at you. Let me share with you what a, um, a Syrian <coughs> political activist opposition uh, who's about 35 years old and has family fight in the area of Homs. Kind of in the. <coughs> right there. His, his family in the opposition groups, I think. And, uh, so I talked to him. I talked to him a lot. But one of our conversations back in 2013, 
Um, he was complaining to me that the Americans won't send in troops. And I said, well, the Americans after Iraq aren't going to send in troops. And, he, and I complained to him that the opposition is too divided and the armed groups are too divided. And he said, well, that's your fault. I said, my fault? Our fault? What, why is that our fault? And he said, because all of the different countries that help the rebel groups, each one of them has their favorite groups, and they send the aid directly to them. And he said, they don't send it through the unified command system that the Syrian opposition set up. And the Syrian opposition did set up a unified command structure. Had a guy named Salim Idris, and General Salim Idris who was in charge of it. I used to talk to Salim on the phone all the time. And it's true, Salim had no control over the weapons flows that were coming into the different armed groups. And I'll be very honest, we had our clients, and Turks had theirs, and Saudis had theirs, and all went in. He said, until you fix that problem, we'll never have a unified opposition. But if you do fix that problem, and you send all the supplies, all your country sent it through one unified chain of command, all of a sudden that chain of command is empowered. I remember that conversation a few months later when I was talking to my French counterpart, the French ambassador working on Syria. I said, Eric, dites moi, tell me, during World War II, when the Americans and the Allies were trying to reconstitute a free French army, so the Americans were involved, the Canadians, the British, other countries, did the Americans like take $5,000 and a couple of Sherman tanks to Colonel Pierre over there and say, Colonel Pierre, here's tanks and some dollars. Would you go fight the Nazis? And the British went over and saw Colonel Henri and went and said, hello, chap, here's 5,000 British pounds and some Spitfires if you fight those damn Nazis. And the Canadians, hello, mate, would you take some Canadian dollars and here's some uh, Canadian made whatever and, and fight the Nazis. And Eric looked at me and said, what, are you crazy? He said, it all went through de Gaulle. It was a unified command. And he said, de Gaulle wouldn't have done it any other way. He would have refused it. He said, that was the only way to have order. And he said, yes. He said, I, he said yes, I understand the point you're making, Brian. So not that the French changed what they were doing. No. So, but in answer to your question, in theory, in theory, it ought to be possible to make them more cohesive. There are big ideological gaps, and this matters to an extent, between some of the groups. As Tarek has said, some of them are really out of line Islamist Salafis. Some of them are very secular. They have very different visions of the kind of future Syrian state. Very different visions. However, since I have talked to all of them on repeated occasions, I can say this. They also all agree that there needs to be a negotiation with the government and with only Syrians, and that there needs to be an agreement on a political process, probably with elections, to decide what that future state looks like. So even if they don't agree on what the state should look like, they agree that there has to be an agreement on a process to get to that state, and that it has to be negotiated. So there's probably enough room to get them cohesive enough to negotiate. And I think, frankly, that's what the meeting in Riyadh in January was able to do so that they can go to a Geneva 3 conference, assuming it can be held. Was this um, general that was, who was calling for a central command chain, was this the Free Syrian Army? Yeah. Yeah, what? And that, isn't that the one that Fred Hoff called the tank in the village? Because the aid wasn't going to him, it was going to groups of <coughs> And he was like a cheerleader. But hasn't he lost credibility because he's not in the country? Fine. Well, I, at this point, you're right, Andy, it couldn't be him. They'd have to have an agreement on it. So we, I think we're going to need to end here, but Lena, you wanted to say something. Yes, I just wanted to say if we're shifting gears a little bit from all of this, you know, despair and hopelessness and nobody knows what's going to happen um, in the future of Syria, I wanted to tell everybody that um, our organization, Kata Foundation, is very much invested in the future of Syrian youth. And I'd like you all, if you can, to visit our website, Karam, K-A-R-A-M, 
foundation.org and look at the programs that we do to help Syrian teens um, and Syrian youth uh, build their own futures through skills like technology and entrepreneurship and journalism and language, um, language acquisition and really interesting and innovative um, pro programs that we develop as an organization and implement on the ground. So I really hope that you can check out our work and look at the videos. But I also wanted to thank um, Phillips Exeter Academy because we have established a program between Khan Foundation and the summer school here where Phillips Exeter is going to accept three Syrian refugee students who are newly resettled in the United States into their summer program this year. And we're working together to get the kids here and hopefully have a really good experience to help them launch their future um, while they're resettling here in the United States. We really want to thank the school for this, and um, hopefully you guys will meet them this summer. Thank you. That's really great. We're able to get a tremendous set of panelists. I hope you all learned as much from them as I did. And please